Thank you so much for tuning in to the Rings and Things podcast with our designer, Kendall. Thank you so much for coming to the pod. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is so fun. Yes, yes. We are (laughs) super excited because today we're talking all about what it takes to have the perfect proposal. So Kendall, tell me a little bit about how you became a jewelry designer. Yeah, I feel like I had a very unique experience. Mm. Um, I went to college not for this Mm. and kind of just found an interest and was like, I'm going to try it out. So I packed my bags and I moved to Los Angeles and that's exactly what I did. I was very, very fortunate to be trained under some of the best people. These are craftsmen who have decades and decades mm-hmm. of experience, diamond dealers who have generational you know, experience going on. So my time in Los Angeles, I mean, I did everything. I learned, I started as an intern that lasted <laughs> like maybe two weeks. Then I did sales. I've done production side of it. I have done, you know, a bit of the marketing side. I did end up going to the GIA Institute. They have a location down in Carlsbad where I got my AJP, which is just like the fancy certificate saying I'm qualified to talk to you about diamonds and gemstones. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I spent years there really just learning all facets of the industry. Um, When I first started, I knew I never wanted to work behind a counter selling stuff. So it was very important to me to always work in the like private client custom jewelry space. So that's really what I focused on. And really, I just got very lucky finding people who were very kind and very willing to help teach me everything that I now know today. Awesome. Very cool. And I mean, it sounds like you went to college for something else. So yeah. there had to have been some passion element to why jewelry. Yes. Um, this story is like, like so funny. But if you know me personally, it's very on brand for mm-hmm. me. So when I graduated college, I was working in the nonprofit space after and I loved it. It was very mm-hmm. fun, but I quickly realized it wasn't going to be for me long term. Um, And honestly, I just found myself researching like the most random careers and like, (laughs) where could I end up? Blah, 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 you know, Mm -hmm. just like thinking and sitting on my couch, like twiddling my fingers, like, what can I do? And I kept looking at diamonds. At the time, I was 22, maybe. So like, I wasn't looking at these these rings to get engaged. I wasn't like window (laughs) shopping for myself. I just kept looking at jewelry. Mm. And I was like, okay, this is really cool. Uh, At the time I was living in Atlanta, there was a jewelry store in Atlanta that was super popular for making like all the wrappers chains, just Uh. these huge pieces. (laughs) And it happened to be right by my office. Mm. So I would walk my little 22 year old butt down to that jeweler (laughs) store and I'd be poking around and they quickly were like, all right, listen, you keep coming in here and like, you're not buying anything. Like Mm. we need you to to stop and I was like okay they actually told you to stop coming yeah well they were they're very luxurious they have very expensive stuff there you had to get buzzed into it so they're like stop coming in here and asking our salespeople all these questions (laughs) like we know you're not buying anything no fault to them but it was just where I got to like look at stuff and I was like this is so cool yeah so I was like all right if I'm spending all of my free time researching this and looking at this and I just think it's cool why don't I try to make something out Mm. of it? So that's where I ended up moving to Los Angeles. I knew in the States, the two biggest diamond hubs are New York or LA. I'm from Florida. Um, I love to drive my car and have little car concerts. Mm. So it was very easy for me to decide, all right, I got to go to LA because they have a beach (laughs) and I can drive my car. So that truly was my deciding factor. And I made the decision, packed my bags up and moved. My lease was ending in Atlanta in like, maybe two weeks. Wow. And that's where I feel very fortunate. And I tell whenever I tell this story, I always like to thank my parents because Mm. I had this idea on my head. And I was talking to my mom and she was like, I think you should just do it. You know, she was like, what happens? Like you go out there. It totally fails. You lost maybe a few months of your time, maybe a little bit of money. Just move back into your dad's house. Like, Mm. it's not the end of the world. If you go out there and if you fail, you have a family you can just fall back on. So I feel very blessed in that way that I was able to just take this opportunity and, like, move out to L.A. completely alone at 22. But it was the best decision I made. I made some of my closest, like, lifelong friends out there Mm. in the industry. And, like, my oh my, I learned way more than I ever thought. I love my university that I went to, but I learned way more (laughs) in my time in LA than I did at my university. Yeah. So 
obviously you've been working with clients for a really long time. You've worked with a lot of proposals. What are the first things you recommend to people planning, starting this like really, you know, kind of scary but exciting time? Um, totally. So first, I don't think a proposal should be an absolute surprise, meaning mm. you should know that your relationship is like taking that step forward yep. and have conversations about it ahead of the proposal. Of course, mm. the actual moment, the ring, how it goes down, all that can be mm. a surprise. Um, but I do think like there should be lots of conversations <laughs> yeah. ahead of the proposal. You should yeah. be on the same page with at least the like major decisions that go behind it. You know, the how yep. much do you want to spend, the timeline, the who's going to be involved in these kind of things. That I think is like the best place to start is just talking to your partner. I mean, yep. you guys are joining a union. So to be on the same page. Yeah, totally. And when you start thinking about that conversation, as someone who maybe wants to have it a complete surprise, how do you talk about it in a way that doesn't give it away? Do you ask her about her favorite restaurant style or like how she wants something, if she wants something more intimate or something where her whole family would be there to celebrate? Mm -hmm. How do you kind of gauge that? I think it's so different for other, like for every couple. Um, but the number one thing I think is the easiest way to slide into it is talking about other people, you know? Mm. Did your friend from high school just get engaged? Is your brother or sister engaged? Like, ask about that. Like, oh, mm. well, what did you think? Did you see Jane Doe got engaged? Like, what was your opinion on that? And kind yeah. of feel out that way. Um, that's probably the most sly way to get feedback without yeah. being like, Hey, babe, what do you want? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's so smart. I didn't even think about that of how often our boyfriends or significant others will say, oh, yeah, what did you think of that their wedding? Like, let's make comments. And then turns out that's all they were doing was collecting Exactly. Evidence. Collect the data about <laughs> yeah. other people. Because um, yep. everyone has an opinion, you know? And, like, yep. that's the first thing when that friend from high school you haven't talked to in 10 years gets engaged. Mm -hmm. Like, it's going in the group chat. So, like, what are we talking about? So what do smart. we think about her ring? You so know? So, smart. like active listening is yep. what I would say. Listen, yep. ask the questions and listen, <laughs> write it down. Oh my gosh, that's so smart. <laughs> so smart. Um, okay, so we've had the conversations. You, The proposer has sort of thought about, okay, I feel like this would be the right time, right place. Then what? What's the next step before actually like setting the date, buying the ring, all of that? Yes, there's so many ways to go about it. And again, like this is so unique for each couple. You know, do you guys mm -hmm. want to work together on it? Do you want to be independent? Is the whole thing a total surprise? Like you can go about it in so many ways. So that would be where I would start is like mm -hmm. how involved do you both want to be in this process? Yeah. Um, after that, I mean, if you're both involved, Go look at stuff together, you know, mm -hmm. like talk about the styles, talk about what you want, set a budget that you're both comfortable with. Um, if you're doing it blind, meaning like the other partner is <laughs> not involved, it's definitely more difficult. Um, I would say find like a trusted family member or friend, whether it's her best friend. Does she have a sister? Um, does she have a Pinterest board? We count mm -hmm. that as a friend, you know, <laughs> yep. and see like what are the common trends? Try to note those. Um, yep. But really... If you can get the basics of the ring and the yep. proposal down, we should be able to help. Like I, I can look at the Pinterest board and I can tell you everything's yellow gold. So we know we want yellow gold. Yep. You know, so you don't need to ask her like, yep. do you wear yellow gold or yep. white gold? You know. Yep. Yep. Um, so just also working with someone who is smart, and uh, that's why like I love female jewelers because like we know and we can help make yep. some of those decisions. Um, as for like timeline. In my opinion, the more time, the better. Yeah. Um, of course, if you need a ring in a rush, like, I'll do what I can to make it happen. But hopefully, the proposal's not a decision you're making a week before. You know, right. we're thinking about this ahead of time. We're yep. planning. We're investing. Yep. It's, Give it some yeah. time. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So if we're saying, okay, we are, let's call it one to three months mm -hmm. pre-proposal, is that enough time to get something that you think would be made exactly for that wearer? Absolutely. Um, I, from my experience, like production on a ring takes typically like two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. That is just the like making the physical piece. So like mm -hmm. figuring out the design and finding the diamond, uh, you need maybe about a week for that if we're pushing it. Yep. So at the earliest, like, or the latest one month, like that should be 
the tightest timeline you give someone unless there is some crazy circumstance. Yep. Um, three months, amazing. We can get whatever you want. We can make the matching wedding band. <laughs> yeah, amazing. <laughs> Perfect. And I would imagine, you know, in three months, you've got time to really marinate on the, the ring. Um, I know, Wove, we have a replica process where you can craft that exact design in real life have her try it on or have them try it on however they want in their life to make sure that it matches their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Is three months enough time to do that process? Is one month enough time to do a, a replica process? Three, I would say absolutely. Because mm -hmm. um, you can make both rings, ship both rings, wear both rings. Um, one month, probably too tight. Mm -hmm. Again, if we're taking like two to three weeks to make a ring, we can't make two of them. Um, right. Unless you're planning on proposing with that replica, which tons of couples do. And it's really great for those couples who I don't really know what she wants. I have an idea. Propose with that replica and then say, hey, babe, I bought the diamond. If you didn't like the setting, no problem. Here's Kendall's email. Go work on it with her. Whatever you want, we'll make happen. That's a really, really good option for people who aren't confident in the design so the replica is amazing for that but yeah making a replica and a reel in one month probably not <laughs> yeah yeah I, I love the idea of using a replica ring at a proposal because you get the best of both worlds you get that surprise factor you get the sort of working without the wear if that's what you know as a proposer what you mm -hmm. want to do but then you get to bring them into the process after the fact before you finalize anything. So any little tweak can be done in time for the big wedding day or quite frankly, within a, another three weeks, she'll have mm -hmm. the exact ring she's always wanted. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so, so smart of an idea and a concept and also a fun way. Like, I mean, I'm biased, but I love designing jewelry and I think it's a really fun thing and you don't get to do it often. Like, there's not many times in your life when you're working with a designer to make a bespoke piece. So being able to say, like, I secured the diamond, which is the hard part <laughs> and the expensive part. Yep. Take the setting, do yep. what you want with it. Like, so fun. Like, now I get to work with the designer and do some sketches and, like, tweak it. It just makes you feel yep. so involved. So I think that's really, really cool. Yep. Um, does take a tiny bit of element of surprise out of it, but not much. I mean, you still yeah. get the surprise <laughs> moment and the surprise ring. Yep. So I love when couples do that. I think it's really, really great. And is both like a wise financial decision because you're not making a whole ring and then she's like yep. oh no right i right. want to remake it you yeah, know yeah um love it awesome. big fan of proposing with the replicas awesome so obviously you meet with a lot of clients all of the time and oftentimes they are men who probably have never bought jewelry before probably don't know much about diamonds mm -hmm. how are they usually feeling what what's the vibe like when you first get on a call with them yes that is my favorite part of the job mm -hmm. um i always wanted to be in kind of the bridal space, but working with the gentleman is so, so fun, or the proposer in general, so fun, because they're coming to you, they're nervous. I think that's mm -hmm. something that is overlooked a lot when you're thinking about engagements. You know, you hear from all the friends and the family, like, make sure they have a white outfit, make sure their nails are done, make sure that you have the photographer hiding behind a bush. It's very based on the wearer and what the wearer wants. You know, how do they want their family there? Like, everything is for the wearer, um, but it's the proposer who's making all the decisions, you know? He is making a large financial investment in this. It is scary. It is, aside from like buying a house or a car, this is one of the biggest purchases that you make as a couple. Um, and if it's bespoke, you're spending a lot of time, you're spending a lot of thoughts. All of a sudden, these gentlemen are learning about literal rocks, you know, and they didn't expect that to come, but you start to research diamonds and you go down this rabbit hole. So I find a lot of men, one, are, are very nervous. They're like, hey, Kendall, I have a vision. I want to do this, but I want it to be perfect for them. Help. And then like, I've gone so far down this research tunnel, like I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore. It's all become a blur, um, which you don't need to know about rocks. You don't need to become an expert on these things. You just have to work with an expert on these things. Yep. So I always find it's a really overlooked moment for the proposer. When they're getting down on one knee, like that's a huge, scary moment. You know, like hopefully yeah. at that time, like you know they're going to say yes. Yep. But you still have to get down and you have to ask and give like a nice speech, hopefully. Um, so it's really intimidating for them to go into it. And I think it's just like the sweetest thing that gets overlooked. Mm -hmm. So I always really try to like, reassure the gentleman like you're doing great she loves you she's going to be happy um no matter what you know it's you she's marrying not the mm -hmm, ring not mm -hmm. the proposal not that moment but it's really sweet i love when the gentlemen come in and you can just tell from the way they talk like 
they're so in love with their partner and the nice things they say it's really awesome so oh I love working with them on that side yeah well and even think about it right like you mentioned they're proposing that alone like just it's scary it's scary it's like <laughs> a lifelong commitment and so when you think about how daunting that ring purchase can be how daunting you know selecting the right stone selecting the right setting hoping that mm-hmm. this is a ring that will last forever and not really knowing you know to your point it's around like this sort of analysis paralysis you're looking at all these different you know GIA elements and trying to understand what VS1 means and yeah, all of these terms you can go that are so far down the rabbit hole so far <laughs> and it's and that doesn't relieve your stress that doesn't relieve your fear it just no. piles on yeah it's like info overload yes. you know yeah totally um, for- and then wanting to know that you're working with a jeweler that's not lying to you, not like trying to price gouge you. It's really, I mean, it's scary. And it's also, again, just leading up to an even more scary moment. Yep. Everything about it is intimidating is, I guess, a good word. Um, But it's awesome. And it's an adrenaline rush. And from clients I've worked with in the past, they say like, as soon as they get the ring, they're like, oh, I wasn't going to propose for three months, but it's in my nightstand and I can't help. Like, I need to get it on her hand now. You know, like I find that getting the ring, that moment for them is like, almost like a sigh of relief like okay I have it now they transition from like so nervous to so excited like this is awesome it's beautiful I can't wait to get on our hand let's do this yeah um and it's really cute to see like I mean most times like we're working with gentlemen and like to see them like giddy and excited over like a piece of jewelry and like giving it to their partner it's really really sweet I love that side of it I love it too I mean I think you know we spend so much time on the sketch side of the world and sort of seeing things um over the phone or Mm -hmm. over a virtual zoom but getting that ring that you just spent months potentially working on designing picking different elements I mean we've designed rings where you know we're looking at like Celtic artistry, like all these different oh, yeah. elements, and then finally seeing it in real life with that sparkle. I mean, yeah, I could see how you could go from fear to giddy very quick. Yep, nothing beats that moment of like having it in your hand. I mean, sketches, awesome, CAD renderings, awesome, but like the real deal, yeah, it it makes it feel real. It's that moment for them of like this is happening, almost like a light switch, like okay. I have it. We are doing this. Yeah. And it's awesome. Oh, so exciting. And I think that's what I love about us being in like this engagement space. It's it's the beginning of something so beautiful and so amazing. And we get to be a part of that. And so giving them like tips and tricks on how to think about it. I mean, any level of relieving stress, mm-hmm. we get to be that trusted partner. And it's it's incredible. Totally. And proposals are almost always kept like under lock and key. You know, right. we don't want them to find out when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. So we are telling as few people (laughs) as we can. We are only telling, maybe we're telling our mom, but only the mom with the tight lips, not the mom with the loose lips, you know, because we are not wanting it to get back to (laughs) her. So it's really awesome. As the jeweler, uh, like we get to be one of the first people to know about this like major life moment yep. that's happening for someone. So like we become their confidant in that way because mm-hmm. they might not be able to tell their best friend, like, I'm so nervous I'm doing this, but they can tell me because I'm not emailing the, yeah, the partner, exactly. you know? <laughs> exactly. Um, so that's really that's sweet. Cool. And they, I think what's also cool about our process is, and working with the jeweler specifically is You can text at any time. You can email. You can hop on a call. So it's not like, you know, you've sort of sent a sketch off into the ether and hoping that it comes out. You're just talking to Kendall. You know, you're just talking to Jesse. It's not like this foreign sort of being that you don't get to really get to know and learn from and just vibe with as you go through the process. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And like, you know, I can speak for myself like I'm a real person and I really do care. And I become friends with a lot of my clients. Like, I want to see, did you just adopt a dog? I want the photo of it. You know, yeah. I want to see the proposal pictures yeah. after. I want to then, maybe they weren't involved, the wearer was not involved. When are we getting on a Zoom? I want to meet her. I want to know what she yeah. thinks, good or well, bad. You know Tell me, so you know. much about her at this Yeah, point. <laughs> I feel like we're friends. Like, can yeah. I be there? Yeah. You know, I have shown up to client proposals before, only oh, when no. asked. But like, <laughs> I actually do need some an amateur photographer. Will you come? Heck yeah, of I'll be there. Be Why there. not? Yeah. You know. Oh, I um, love so that. it's really sweet. And uh, yeah, working with like a real person, I hope provides a level of 
comfort for this like intimidating totally. moment. Totally. Oh my gosh, I love that. So let's talk a little bit about inspiration spaces. So you mentioned a little earlier, you can sort of reach out to a friend or trusted family member. But I want to talk more about that design process. Mm-hmm. Like if I were a proposer and I'm thinking, you know, what elements can I work into a ring? What are some of the things that you usually see clients bring or some of the more like uh, interesting elements that people bring to that design process? So a lot of Pinterest boards. Mm. We get a lot of like, hey, she made this board. Here it is, which I love. That is incredibly helpful. I can take, say there's 20 photos on there. I'm able to look at it. They all may look the same to you, but Mm. I can look at it and kind of see like, all right, 90% of them are yellow gold. A bunch of them have hidden halos. Like there's some reoccurring trends in there. So that's incredibly helpful. Um, Or even like photos of family members or friends rings. Maybe her best friend got engaged and she loves the ring. You know, Mm -hmm. any inspo photos, wherever it comes from, those are really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially since like jewelry terminology is confusing. We have crazy words for all these different bits of metal. (laughs) So I don't expect a client to ever come in and say like, hey, she wants a traditional basket. Like I never think they will know that, but I can look at the photo and be like, okay. They want a traditional basket, you know? Yeah. So Pinterest is a great place. Um, If they have ever, like, tried things on on their own hand, awesome. Like, what did we note from that experience? Um, Or even just, like, trusted family and friends. Like, maybe she's told her sister, I love oval diamonds. Yeah. And she said it slyly. And now he knows. (laughs) And now we know, you know? Yeah. So it can come from really anywhere. But the more, the merrier. I always tell my clients, like, Give me as much as you have. I'd rather have it all and be able to sort through it and decode kind of it. Yep. And even if it's things you hate, send me mm. the rings that you think are really ugly and tell me. Because mm. now I know like maybe all those really ugly rings are super chunky. I'm like, got it. She's a dainty gal. Yeah. So even knowing like the what we don't like, awesome. Oh, great. I love that. I think a lot of times we only think about what we do like. Mm-hmm. That element of what we don't like Perfect. Because I think a lot of times, like, we see a lot of sort of the standard rings. Um, So, and also for this pod, we're going to be trying to speak as sort of layman's (laughs) terms as possible. Um, It's a little easier for me since I'm not a designer. Um, But now I've been around engaged rings for a little while. So I'm going to try to help myself by not using jargon. But if we think about, you know, the trends, right, of a, like, diamond that's really sparkly and beautiful that sits on a very skinny band Mm -hmm. or so if a client were to come and say, hey, like, I love the, I have these inspo photos, you can kind of deduce, okay, the band size or the ring carrot size and you can help Mm -hmm. them sort of figure out not only is it possible to create but also price range what types of stones would fit well with this how are we going to keep it the most secure Mm -hmm. talk to me more about like how those conversations go with the proposer as he's sort of prepping like okay not only do I want something that she's going to love from a style perspective but something that's going to last her the rest of her life and potentially a couple generations after. Yes. Um, structural like stability is so important. We want to make sure the ring, one, like fits your style now, but engagement rings, wedding bands, these are heirloom pieces. These are pieces that we are intending to wear for life. So maybe we're getting engaged at 27, but we should be wearing this ring, hopefully, at mm-hmm. 67, yep. you know? Um, and of course, you can always reset a ring. The diamond is the investment part. The setting is the design part. Um, So you can always change it, but most times the goal is, like, wear this ring forever. In that case, I do think a lot of the trends of, like, super dainty pieces, um, which is huge right now. Everyone wants the daintiest ring they can get. Not strong. Like, you're wearing this every single day. Little things like picking up your grocery bags, like, that will damage your ring over time. Um, Most rings are made of gold, whether that be white, yellow, Mm -hmm. rose. And gold is malleable. You can move it. Um, Even just, like, the heat from your body will reshape Mm. it so the thinner the metal the more or the less time you're going to have with it if that makes Mm. sense like this ring it is inevitable it will change shape to your finger it will get damaged a bit we're wearing these every day and we're not delicate flowers all day during (laughs) life you know um so definitely thinking of just things like are we having a massive stone on this thin thin band Mm -hmm. how do we add extra support to it are we making it a cathedral style Um, which is where like the ring swoops up and connects to the basket Mm. that's holding the diamond rather than a head-on where it's just kind of like 
there's one point of contact. Mm. Um, little decisions like that can make great impacts for like the longevity of your ring. Yep. Um, and I think that's super important. So I always try to remind my clients like, yes, we're wearing this ring now, but we're also hoping to wear the ring in 30, 40 years. Let's try to keep it that far. Yep. But at the end of the day, if you grow out of it, the diamond is what matters. Let's just reset it. Let's make it a new style. And we do that often. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really fun projects too, because you evolve over time. You're not yep. going to be the same person at 27 as you are at 67. So your yep. style will likely change. Yep. Um, so knowing both, kind of both sides of it, like one, yes, we want to plan to make the ring last forever. But if it doesn't, that's okay. Like yep. we will change it. Okay. I love it. I yeah. love it. So speaking of durability mm -hmm. and lasting, worst case scenario, what happens if something happens to that ring? If we lose a stone, like what should a proposer be thinking about in terms of insurance, protection, just in case anything goes crazy? What should they be thinking about before they hand that ring off to somebody else? Yes. Okay. I'm passionate about this one. Get your ring insured. Get <laughs> any fine jewelry insured. There are tons of companies that do it independently. Um, you can add it to your homeowners or your renter's insurance. It may already be in there and you don't know. Take that appraisal. Whoever is selling your ring, we always give appraisals for our clients. Mm -hmm. It's what is most important. Um, that's really the document that you need to get it insured. Get it insured. It's about 2% of the total value annually. It is not a large mm -hmm. lump sum of money and it really protects you. There's one term that a lot of companies use. It's called dis or mysterious disappearance. That essentially means I'm at the mall. I'm trying on jewelry at Bloomingdale's and I leave my ring on the counter and I accidentally walk away. It's gone, you know? Period. Um, that should be covered with mysterious disappearance. Mm. Your company should say, we will pay you out for it or work with the jeweler of your choice to build a like, like a similar ring with like specs. Um, that is incredibly important. If you work with me, you will get an email immediately following <laughs> your proposal with insurance information and how to do right. it. Um, that is crucial. For the setting, um, it, little damages will happen. If you have a hidden halo or pave on the band, which is just the diamonds on the band, those stones are teeny tiny and they are held by teeny or tinier bits of metal. One of those will fall out. I always tell my clients to think about it as like a a not if, but when. Like at some point, mm. one of those will fall out. Not a big deal. It's not expensive. We cover it. Send it back to our office. We'll fix it. Um, pop a new diamond in there. Very, very easy. Not an end of the world situation. Um, insurance really is to protect for those worst case situations. The the whole ring is gone or yep. the prong got loose and that diamond is is gone. It's really yep. for that center diamond. Yep. Um, and so important. So yes, please insure your jewelry. <laughs> if you take one thing away, we love jewelry insurance. <laughs> yes, we love jewelry insurance. Um, wonderful. And is this mysterious disappearance term or clause, is that in standard insurance policies or like do you want to double check to make sure that it's in there? I would definitely double check. I know okay. who I have my pieces insured with. It is like pretty boilerplate on there. Okay. Um, I don't think it would be included in homeowners or renters. Mm. So just good to mention, see what coverage you have. Um, every insurance will be different. You know, some will require a police report to be submitted. Some may not. Um, mm -hmm. So just pay attention to what policy you're getting and, you know, how much you're paying. I see it's on average about 2% of the total appraised value okay. annually. Um, so it's not a huge chunk, but gives you lots of security. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, um, I don't know if you saw, there was like an E news reporter on the red carpet this year yes. who lost uninsured. Her, her stone was uninsured. Uninsured. It was like a four <gasps> carat or something, oh four or five gosh. carats. I saw that crazy. <laughs> that is why we get it uh, insured. Yes. <laughs> and to have a stone that big, huge. That's a car. Yeah. You know, oh, you would have your car insured. Absolutely. Well, and if you think about her, so I had talked to someone in our workshop about mm -hmm. it, and we looked at the setting that was mm -hmm. on there, right? And when we talk about making sure that the center stone you have and the design, the setting around that center stone is durable, keeps that stone safe and mm -hmm. secure, that bezel setting she had was so thin that, like, I'm not shocked. It's yep, sad, out it but goes. I'm not shocked. Big, big stones on thin, thin bands is like you're setting yourself up for failure, you yeah. know? Um, and to do that and not have it insured, like <laughs> oh, you are asking gosh. for it. These are yeah. our hands. Yeah. We use these daily. Yeah. You could put your hand in your jean pocket and you can move that prong. You know, it's the tiniest things you uh. don't 
yeah expect yep. that's crazy and to do it in such a public situation oh my gosh oh. well and, and i'm just thinking about the person who found that stone oh my god they the thing is they probably like are looking at it like oh it's fake you know right. like they probably don't even Never would have know yes that someone would let a real diamond like this just insane fall. when i was oh working gosh. in the diamond district in los angeles whenever i'd like walk to lunch or go get a coffee down the street um you stare at the floor because you're like, what? who's dropping what? <laughs> and you know, am I finding a <laughs> ruby so near the drain? Funny. Like, you are looking oh at the floor to see gosh. who drops who what. Oh um, and you gosh. can find stuff. Little things. <laughs> but I found little things. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, great. Well, I know. Um, so we've covered kind of how to think about inspo when we start, mm -hmm. who to talk to as a proposer, um, thinking about, you know, working with a designer. So it just like helps you relieve stress. Yes. Make sure that you are choosing the right stone that will fit the design that will protect that total ring mm -hmm. forever. And then the insurance to make sure that if anything protected. crazy happens, <laughs> you are protected. Are there any other tips and tricks you think about, you know, when you're working with someone who's about to propose? Um, any advice for them? Um, hmm. I would say like there's no rule book. Um, every couple is so unique, you know, like you and your husband are going to be different than your sister and her husband mm -hmm. and what they want for a proposal is going to be so different. So there is no like map or rule book to follow for any of this. So I just think it's really important to like listen to your partner, the hints that they may be dropping. What would they want? Think about that. Um, and in all ways, whether that's for like the actual moment of proposing and who's there, whether that's for the ring, if that's how much you should be spending on the ring, you know, all of those things should be like thought about and factored into some of these decisions. Um, and then just have fun with it. Like this is a moment that hopefully you do once. Um, and it should be fun. You know, like it is you two are joining a union. It is exciting. It is an adrenaline rush. So although it is scary and it is intimidating, like try to remember this is a you're not being forced to do this. This is a fun, <laughs> positive experience yeah. and cater it to you, too. So it will be awesome and memorable. And you'll just be on like cloud nine. All right, Kendall, we're going to do some rapid fire questions. Hit me so with it. just in case no one wants to watch the <laughs> entire pod, you can get all you need from this moment right here. Let's do it. Okay, so when designing your engagement ring, do you immediately go into designing the wedding band? Do you do that before proposal, after proposal? When does the wedding band begin? Um, we can do it always. If the bride to be or whoever the wearer knows that they knows both styles that they want awesome let's knock it out then it just avoids you having to send your ring back for us to match it later if they have no idea what they want maybe don't maybe just get the engagement ring and let them be a part of the the wedding band process um it's fun anyway so it's not like a hassle and yeah. you have no idea how long your engagement's going to be so their preference may change in a year or two that it takes to actually get to the wedding so both ways neither is right or wrong great um, so when you think about engagement rings, mm -hmm. obviously we're going to have a bias because we develop engagement rings every day, but how do you feel about custom rings versus something off the shelf? Yes, I am a firm, firm believer in your piece should be custom or bespoke to each person. Um, aside from the design, even if it is the most simple solitaire, you're picking that diamond and the setting should be made for that diamond. It's important for just security. If you are taking a setting that was made for a round diamond, perhaps, and you're now popping the head or the basket that holds the diamond off and are like soldering a new head on there it's just like you're frankensteining the ring and we mm. don't want that you know yeah so i do think just for like getting exactly what you want making sure it is made for both the wear and for the stone so it's safer and better done um and it's a huge purchase so it's like you're spending all this money it's not much more expensive if even sometimes it can be cheaper to get something custom made because you're going to a company who isn't paying this massive overhead um so I would say, yeah, 100% important. I've only ever worked in custom jewelry, and I will only ever work in custom jewelry. Yeah, totally. Um, great. So, oof, this is one of the toughest questions. Oh, no. <laughs> that I believe people come to when we're thinking about uh, getting their engagement ring is, dun, 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 how much do we spend? Oh, man. Okay, oof. there is no right or wrong answer for this one. Um, my personal belief and take this with a grain of salt, it is my belief. Um, it should be an investment. You are investing into this person. It is supposed to be like, hey, I'm showing you I am committed. 
but everyone's version of investment is is different. I don't think this is something you should go into debt over. I firmly mm. believe that the engagement ring is just the beginning. You are going to plan a wedding. Maybe you're buying a house. Maybe you're starting a family. The expenses will snowball. So you mm. want it to be an amount that you're comfortable with, that your partner will feel special wearing, but not something that's going to hinder you in other facets of life. Um, one thing I always tell my clients is like, think about a number. What number sounds like crazy to you? Maybe they're like a $20,000 ring. That's insane. Okay. Take off 10%. Does that sound better to you? Mm -hmm. And kind of just keep reducing until you're like, okay, wait, I could do 7,000. Like, Yep. That sounds good, you know, yep. and then stay there. See, yep. can we get what she wants? Can we get what you want? Are we happy? You don't need to stretch yourself most of the time. Um, so, yeah, that would be my advice. And again, this is one of those things that you should be talking about with your partner. Yep. Maybe you're dating the girl who she wants an $80,000 ring. Maybe you're dating the girl who she just wants a plain gold band. You know, yep. like these are conversations. You are joining a union. Your finances may or may not be combined. Mm -hmm. So would she be okay with you spending $30,000 on a ring if it means she can't get a house, you know? Right, right. Think about those things. But such a personal question and every couple is so different. So there's yeah. no, that rule of it should be a month or three months. Yeah, of the salary. salary. <laughs> That's not a thing. Don't don't yeah. listen to that. No yeah. one no one wrote that down. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's not real. Well, and I think also, you know, you bring up the differences in the band that you choose mm -hmm. or the diamond size. And there's so many different types of stones, right? Like lab-grown stones these days are so affordable, but you can skill, still get that blingy look without that huge price tag. So I think that there are just ways in which that our designers can work with you to say, okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your budget? Let's figure out the best Absolutely. option for those different details because, you know, everybody is going to have something that they're optimizing for. Some people optimize mm -hmm. for carat weight. Some people optimize for the band itself to be more ornate and unique. It really totally. depends. And your jeweler should not be trying to push you beyond your means. That is something... Mm -hmm. I always tell my clients very honestly, like, give me a ceiling. If you tell me, Kendall, I want to spend $8,000, but I can go up to 10, I will not show you anything that'll push you over 10. To me, yep. it's just, I'm going to use the word slimy, mm -hmm. to be like, okay, you told me you can spend 10, but here's the most gorgeous stone. It's 15, because now it's a sales right. trick. Now you don't feel good. Right. Now right. you're looking at that stone and you right. want it, but you can't afford it. And to right. me, that's, that's mean, you yep. know, to like, Tank the dog in front yeah. of you and be like, whoop, can't it's have like it. A realtor taking you to the house that you definitely exactly. can't afford, and now you can't unsee it. So be um, honest with who you're working with. Yeah. Tell them where you want to be, and hopefully they respect that. And yeah. if they don't respect that, Take it for what it is. That's a mm -hmm. red flag. Yeah, yeah, totally. We should do a whole episode on red flags from Oh my jewelers. God, we should. There are so many. <laughs> yeah, and like, again, you know, we talk about, you know, you're making decisions about an investment for your life. You oftentimes won't know mm -hmm. the sort of like terms or the things to think about um, because, you know, as proposers, we're not the experts on yep. this stuff. So you have to work with an expert that you trust yes. and you believe is not trying to just sell you out the wazoo. They're really trying trying to find the best option for your budget, for your lifestyle, for your wearer. Totally. Maybe this is like the millennial in me, but like good vibes are a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. If you're getting a bad vibe from the store or the person you're working with, yep. don't do not do it. There's so many places you can buy a gorgeous yep. ring. You want to feel good about it from start to end. If you walk away from that purchase being like, wow, I kind of think I got ripped off right, or like right. they didn't seem to really care. Right. That just already like for the whole process, now you have a bad tint on that experience, right, you know? Right. So I think like picking who you work with and like good vibes and trust and, you know, like that's yep. very important. Yeah. And I think sometimes, you know, when one of my questions I had for you it, it was sort of this idea of shopping for an engagement mm -hmm. ring online versus shopping in a store. Um, there are definitely pros and cons on both sides. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that you kind of lose to your point around feeling the vibe and understanding and, and really trusting that partner is if you say, hey, you know, I have the inspo photos of what she wants to wear. And so I'm just going to go into a big box retailer and grab the thing and leave. 
there's no relationship there. There's no nope. sort of personal experience. You may sit down with someone for a few minutes to talk about different options. Mm-hmm. They're going to sort of show you diamonds and say, okay, here you go. Yep. And that and that's it. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can really develop a relationship with someone who's going to really be your bestie and mm-hmm. help you figure out all this stuff and not Absolutely. make this investment on your own. Totally. And it's 2024. Like, what can't you do online? Literally. You know, like, <laughs> you can buy a ring online, yeah. you can do it confidently, and you're yeah. not sacrificing anything. Yep. Um, so both ways, I mean, you can do it all of which ways. I work, I would say, 99% of my clients remotely. And from what I know, they're all very happy. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's yep. a very comfortable process. Um, and you can still get, like, all of the same reassurance from that process, a little less of the nerves. And you're not being forced to make, like, game time decisions. You know, like, Mm. we are in this store. Are you walking out with it? Yes or no? Like, we're on Zoom. You're not walking out with it either way. So if you want to take a minute and think about this, do that, you know? Yep. There's no pressure. I think that's such a good point, this, like, game time decision of it all. Yeah. Because you feel like, you know, you you plan for this day to go to the store. You've been talking to this person who's really nice at the counter, Mm -hmm. right? Like, they're just, you know, nice people. They're showing you these rings. And so you kind of feel that pressure to just choose and go or to be able to say, like, that is check the box. I'm done with that part of this proposal planning. Yep. Let's keep going. Um, and, you know, when we make impulse buys, they aren't always the smartest. So exactly. having room to, like, <laughs> breathe and say, okay, like, let me make sure that this is what I want, um, I think is huge. And mm-hmm. then, you know, to your point around working online, we have the replica process for that, right? So not only are you building trust with you as a designer, but being able to say, okay, I'm gonna create this beautiful ring that I think looks beautiful online, looks like it'd be beautiful online, but then I get to try it on. I get to let her try it on. Totally. And make sure that it's exactly what we were expecting before actually buying anything. Yep, that process is so awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, I love it, I think it works really well. Aside from like seeing the product and gaining confidence, um, it just really makes both like the wear and the proposer at ease because mm. you're talking to me online, you know, and like you're seeing me and we're talking. I'm a real human, which is great. Mm-hmm. I hope that gives some reassurance. Yep. But you're not holding anything. You're not seeing it under the sparkle light. So when you get to like see the piece, whether you're sharing that with the wearer that who you're proposing to or not, um, it just really does instill like, OK, cool. I can see what their craftsmanship is like. Mm-hmm. I can see that this is real. I understand what the timelines look like. I feel much more confident. Let's go. And a lot of times that's what these clients need is Mm -hmm. just like a hug, you know, (laughs) like they just need to be reassured. This is scary. We don't know what we're doing. They just need the like, okay, okay, okay. Awesome. Let's go. I got this. Um, Which is so important to, you know, you want to walk away feeling good about it. (laughs) Totally. Totally. I totally agree. Okay. Next rapid fire question. Okay. Do you ask the parents? Do you talk to the parents? How does that work? This is another know your audience answer. Um, I'll use my personal experience from this. I'm one of three sisters, and my older sister, she did not want to be asked. She did not want her partner to ask my dad. It just was something she was like, she took the the route of, I'm not property, and I don't want to feel like you're asking for me. Like, I'm me. Mm. I'm an adult. I get to make this decision. My family is not. Um, My dad totally respected that. He was okay Mm -hmm. with it. He has four daughters. There are many opportunities. <laughs> when my partner proposed to me, he did ask my father. Um, I wouldn't say it was more of an ask, but like a, hey, I'm going to do this. Do I have your blessing? And I know my dad cried. It was an awesome moment, super sweet. So he got that moment from one daughter. He didn't get it from the other daughter, and he wasn't upset or super overjoyed either way. You know, he respected us as individuals and was like, you guys are adults making an adult decision. So I would say know your partner. Um, It is a sweet moment though, like for the families and also family relationships are so complicated. So again, know your audience. Um, But it is a really sweet moment. I loved hearing about it afterwards. So um, it can go either way. No answer for this one. Yeah. No, I love that you mentioned that and you told that story because I think so often we think about, you know, asking a parent for a blessing Mm -hmm. as that like property move. Yes. And I've never actually. Which I think traditionally is where it comes from. Right, right, right. Like we're going to But that's not what we're doing in 2024. He's not going and saying, 
I'm going to marry your daughter. How many cows? You know, right, like, right, exactly. I love this idea of using it as a way for the proposer to have a really sweet moment, a mm -hmm. bonding moment, sort of a open conversation with their new, you know, parent in law, whoever it is. And using that as a way to kind of add richness to the proposal, yeah, right? It makes because it you sweet. Love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love, I love that. I've never thought about it like that, but um, you know, when the time comes, I think having that conversation will be will be awesome. For yes. Parent. And yeah. again, if I could just say, know your audience. My my partner asked my dad. He did not ask my mom. My mom loves to talk, and he asked my dad maybe a week before because he knew my family shares everything. We are in the group chat twenty four seven. Mm. So he was like. Leslie, I'm sorry you're not getting a heads up because you will say something. <laughs> yeah. No fault. You yeah, know, you yeah. are who you She'll are. So we excited. love your big mouth, but <laughs> yeah. she's excited. She yeah. wants to tell everyone. So yeah. Yeah. only my dad knew and it was about a week before. So there okay. was no room for slippage. Right, right. That's a real thing. <laughs> yep. Gotta be careful. Okay, next rapid fire question is, do you tell them to get dressed, get their nails done or not? Um, oh, every answer is going to be know your audience. Um, I... Do you think it's important to like, well, I don't know, actually. So like, again, know your audience. If she went, if she's okay with that at home in pajamas, then she's okay with that at home mm -hmm. in pajamas. I do think most women would like to look and feel good in that moment because it's a big moment and yeah. it's exciting and yeah. maybe you're going to celebrate after. So whether it's like, hey, I made dinner reservations for a little bit nicer of a place, then they'll know to get dressed up. Um, but I wouldn't get too caught up on the tiny details. Don't be like, Hey, sweetheart, like that white dress in your closet's really good for tonight. You know, yeah, like if you're not normally yeah, helping yeah. style you. <laughs> don't start now. Don't start you now. You know, just yeah. set up the scenario. So we're going somewhere, whether it's a picnic or a restaurant. Mm. And hopefully like they're going to want to feel good in that moment anyway. Yeah. So they'll get ready for that moment. And that is perfect. You can always take engagement photos later. So we can, yeah. the proposal's an awesome moment. If you need the photos for the save the dates, we can get those another time. So smart. Okay, so that actually mm -hmm. leads to my last rapid fire question. Is the photographer worth it or not? <sighs> this is a hard one. So I do think it's worth it to have photos of the mm -hmm. moment and video if possible. Yes. Doesn't mean you need a professional photographer or a videographer if you are spending the money on a grand occasion. If you're dropping $1,000 on florals on the beach, why not have the <laughs> yeah, photographer, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I did not have a professional photographer. I had my best friend with a borrowed camera. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad I have those photos. And I think they came out beautifully. Um, she is not a photographer, <laughs> but it came out awesome. And now yeah. I have those. That was perfect for me. We maybe took five minutes of photos after the fact. And then it was done. Let's go celebrate. It wasn't like mm -hmm. a 30-minute photo shoot where now we're kind of like, you're losing the hype of that moment yeah, because yeah. now we're stressed about posing. Yeah. Um, so I'd say if you can swing it and you want to swing it, get the photographer, get a best friend in a bush with an iPhone to record <laughs> the video, but not essential. You'll likely do an engagement shoot uh, down the line yeah. for those professional like needs. Yeah. So not crucial, but if you can do it, it's so nice to have. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I would imagine too, like you've been saying the whole pod of knowing your audience, right? So it's so important for interest for, you know, for instance, if you have a, you know, a wearer who mm -hmm. is a full time influencer, they're going to want that video. They're going to want oh, those yep. photos. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to sort of showcase. If you have somebody who's sort of off the grid and like loves intimate moments that are just between you and them, then maybe, you know, you don't necessarily need it, but you do exactly. the photo shoot afterwards. So, you know, like you said, everything is about knowing your audience and mm -hmm. knowing what they are going to want for such a momentous point in their life. Yep. You can do it all of which ways. Again, there's no rule book yeah. for these. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the tips we have for proposers this go around. Kendall, thank you so much for sharing. I know all of you. I'll see you next time on the pod. Awesome. Thank you. It's so fun.